with that, I shall introduce tonight's speaker, Tina Beer and Monelli's scrapbook, Identifying and Inter Interpreting Historic Photographs. Many people become heirs to a box of unidentified family photos and have no clue what to do with them. Tina will offer solutions for identifying those lost family members by teach teaching attendees how to use genealogy sources in conjunction with observational techniques. Tina Beard is the owner of Tamarack Genealogy and is also a genealogy local history librarian at the Plainfield Public Library. Tina ex lectures extensively on topics including genealogical methodology, military research, and archival preservation. She is a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild and the Association of Professional Genealogists, as well as the first VP of the Illinois State Genealogical Society, board director for the Northern Illinois Historic League and the Oswego Heritage Association. She volunteers her time with several historical and genealogical societies across Illinois. Tina has provided uh, research assistance for nearly 20 years and has been researching her family's history as time permits for over 30 years. She's a rabid baseball fan, go Nats, as we were just discussing in the chat, and she and her family have visited 24 out of 30 major league ballparks across the United States. With that, I welcome Tina. Let me stop sharing so you can start. Paula and Donna and all of you, I'm delighted that you are with me tonight. Yes, in cold and frigid Illinois and, you know, 15 degree temperatures, so I'm a little jealous of your 40 you know, 41 degrees there. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Okay, so hopefully all of you can see yep. my presentation. Perfect. I am going to turn my camera off for two reasons. One, because you don't need my little bobbing head and my waving talking hands as I'm giving my presentation. I can be quite distracting. And also so you could see the full screen and see each of the images, because I'm going to talk a little bit about how to pull out details. And if you're watching me wave my hands, you are looking at the screen. Um, it also saves bandwidth. Um, so it'll help make sure that I don't glitch or drop out on any of you. So I'll turn my camera back on when we get to the Q&A portion. So bear with me for just a moment here. Okay, so for each of you who are on tonight, I'm sure all of you, myself included, have wound up with photographs that seem impossible to identify. It might not be a rapid process. It might not be um, six hours. It might not be six months. It might not even be six years. But eventually, the unidentified can start to become identified just by using the information you already know about your family, coupling that with some observational techniques, you know, a, a giant game of matching. I've seen this background in another photo, or I've seen that chair in another picture, um, as well as taking advantage of genealogical resources and local history resources. So in your handout, at the very end, I tried to focus on Virginia specific resources that you could use. So while today's presentation is going to seem pretty generic, I'm just going to give you examples based on my area and, and some of the, the places in the country where I've done my research. I definitely wanted to make sure that I focused on some amazing resources that you have available to you in Virginia, besides just things like Library of Congress and the Library of Virginia, some other smaller genealogical collections at local library systems and some really cool sites that you can benefit from. So if we get started and we start thinking about <clears throat> what types of materials are out there, this is a picture of my grandma Nellie and my mom. My mom is about three years old. She's sitting on the hood of my grandpa Larry's car. They were visiting my Aunt Evie in southern Missouri in the town of Elsinore, which is incredibly teeny tiny, and I wouldn't expect anybody to know where that is. But these are details that I know because they're details that were conveyed to me. But if I just found this photo in a box without any details, without anybody to tell me who might be in it, what am I going to do? How am I going to start to discover who potentially these two people could be? Are they mother and daughter? Are they grandma and daughter? Are they, you know, cousin and niece? What's the connection? And, and how can I start to figure that out? So what you want to do is you want to start to think about ballpark generalities and ballpark dates. 
If you're lucky enough that you have items already in scrapbooks, do not take them apart. If you're planning on taking them apart, definitely make sure that you scan each page or take a photo of each page as it is in its entirety, because there's connections there. And if you stop par- start popping photos out of out of an album, you lose that connectivity. Why were these photos put together on this page? Were they put together because they were the same place, the same family, the same era, the same size, vertical versus horizontal? What is the reason behind it? So if you're dealing with albums, you already have a leg up because you already have connections already inherently built in to how that scrapbook was put together. But if you don't, if they're just loose in a box that somebody hands you, you can start to separate these into eras. Am I dealing with black and white photos or color photos? Am I dealing with carte de visites or tintypes or black and white salt prints? Am I dealing with people who are in the city or in the country? And you can start to kind of get a grasp of what kind of eras, what kind of places, what kind of families you're dealing with. So when you look at photos, you're looking for markers. You're looking for identifiers. You're looking for things like identifiable street names or signs, identifiable buildings. You're looking for things like vehicles, cars, trucks, whatever it happens to be. Is there a license plate on the front of the car that you can read that's going to give you a state? Or even historically, they would replace license plate stickers yearly. So is there a sticker that gives you the year that that the picture is taken because of the, the sticker on the car. Are there things like um, trees or um, other identifiable features in the background, mountains, a lake, a river, a bridge, something that you might recognize from your childhood or by stories that your family might have told? You know, and then obvious things, you know, like is somebody wearing a name tag? Are they... Um, standing in front of a business that might have been owned by somebody in the family. So the background details are equally as important as the person who's standing in the photo. But to get even more specific than that, are you lucky enough that there's a photographer's name on the on the photo or on the back of the photo? You want to look at what type of material is it made out of? So not just is it black and white or is it color, but as I mentioned earlier, is it a tintype? Is it a carte de visite? Is it a daguerreotype? Is it a cyanotype? Each of those things has specific eras, specific time periods when those types of materials were being used. So we're going to focus on that a little bit more about halfway through. What style of clothing are people wearing? So I apologize, guys. Men's fashion does not change anywhere near as rapidly as women's fashions do. So if you have a a picture like the two gentlemen that are in this particular photo, you're looking at other items that might happen to be in the photo, not necessarily strictly what they're wearing. But there are some details that you start to pull out of photos when you really start to look and analyze them. Like the gentleman sitting in the chair is wearing a bowler hat, but the gentleman who's standing against the wall is wearing a straw hat. So this tells me that it's warm weather. You're not going to wear a straw hat in the middle of winter. You're going to wear a straw hat in late spring and into summer. So it gives me an idea of when potentially the photo could have been taken. I'm going to be looking at things like the the background. Are they using just a plain wall? Are they using um, a fancy screen? Is the photo taken indoors or outdoors? Is it taken in a photography studio? Is it a professional photo? Or is it something that is a candid that was taken by friends or family, you know, outside or even for the holidays? Um, Just by in the chat, if you want to share, I won't be able to see it. But um, how many of you took a family photo? How many of you gathered together over the Thanksgiving weekend and took a photo together with brothers or sisters or cousins or other family members? So those candid photos are really, really important. I'm going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes as well. So you're looking for these things because it's going to start to help you. Okay, well, who do I know? You know, this particular print might say that it was um, from a photographer for Milwaukee. Well, who in my family tree, if I do a search on Milwaukee, who in my family tree is going to pop up as having lived in Milwaukee at any given time? 
um, who in my family would match the number of people who are in this particular photo. So you're going to start to think who could potentially fall into this category of, you know, Civil War era tintypes or 1930s salt prints. You're going to start to be thinking about who in my family tree is going to match these parameters that I'm writing down. And clothing styles are a really big part of that because we can easily identify a 1960s A-frame dress versus an 1860s Civil War, you know, hoop skirt um, and button-down jacket. You know, we recognize the straight skirts and the bobbed hair of the 1920s. You know, we have an understanding of, you know, the big, loose, floppy buns with the big, poofy white sleeved shirts of the 19 aughts and the teens. We kind of have general ideas of time periods based on clothing styles. Once again, it's a lot easier with women than it is with men, unfortunately. Um, but all of those kinds of things will help you start to think, you know, well, who in the 1910s could have been living in Richmond, who in the 1960s could have been living in San Francisco, and you're searching your tree to try to find matches. You might have multiple matches, but at least it's giving you a start where, okay, it could be in this family. It could be in, you know, dad's family versus mom's family. It might be, in, you know, dad's mom's family versus mom's dad's family. And you're starting to put together ideas of, you know, probabilities. Who potentially could this be? So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about clothing and about photographers' backgrounds, um, but props are a great way to tie photos together. And I'm going to show you several examples towards the very end of my presentation about, and I'm going to talk about what I call the ubiquitous chair. It's like every photography studio on the planet in the 1860s, the 1880s had the same chair. So it's like the one prop you cannot use to help you identify family groups because everybody had that particular chair. But what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to read your photo. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a technique called active seeing in just a minute. But if I look at this photo, I see a man and a woman. She's got short hair. She's wearing a great big bow. She has white shoes on. If I look at the frame, the surround, the cardboard surround that that houses this particular photo, there's a lot of details there that help me narrow down what I'm dealing with. And I'm lucky enough that it even has the photographer's mark in it that tells me that this particular couple had this picture taken by a studio in Aurora, Illinois. So if I look at this, okay, it's an art deco frame. She's got short bobbed hair. She's wearing white shoes. I would probably ballpark this to the 1930s. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is the wedding photo for this particular couple and they married in 1936. If it's not specifically their wedding photo, it's probably taken um, sometime around that time, but I'm utilizing what she's wearing. I'm utilizing the photographer, uh, Mark. I'm utilizing the encasement that this is in to help me start to put together a potential ID. Now, if you are lucky enough, I, I have to tailor my presentation to the fact that I'm talking to an organization in the South, um, but tax stamps, the Union, the United States of America during the Civil War, had imposed a tax on what were considered luxury goods starting in 1863 and going until the end of the war in August of 1865. So when you think about how short of a window this is, we're talking two and a half years, 1863, 64 and a half of 65. If you have a tax stamp on one of your photos, you are instantly ballparking your photo to this time period in which tax stamps were being used. And luxury goods at the time were considered everything from photographs to jewelry to property to things like wagons and carriages, um, clocks and 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 things things of the like. If you were purchasing an entire album, only one of those photos would need to have the tax stamp on the back of it. So you're not going to see a tax stamp on every Civil War era photo that was taken in the United States. Um, but you're going to see it if you happen to have albums. I'm not encouraging you to take apart albums. Um, but if you've already, if you have the ability to slide them out, I would be looking 
probably for the tax stamp. And not only would it give me the, the name of the photographer potentially on the back, but if you have a tax stamp and there's no photographer's mark on the backside, you can still start to figure out who it is because in order to cancel the stamp to show that the tax was paid, the photographer would write his initials across the back of it. So while this specifically says DC Pratt Photography you know, on Broadway in Aurora, Illinois, he signed his initials DCP. So if that mark was missing, I could try to figure out what DCP is based on what photography studios might be in the area that this particular album was produced to figure out who the photographer might have been. But tax stamps are an amazing find if you're lucky enough to have them because you can date that photo to a specific time period. So when I look at this photo and I see, you know, Jeanette in this image, I can identify it as a Civil War era based on her hair, based on the dress that she's wearing, the, the really tight button down jacket and the separate skirt that goes along with it, the chair that she's leaning against, the simplicity of the background. Because you'll see backgrounds evolve, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Backgrounds evolve from just plain walls, um, no ornamentation on the image itself, to really elaborate backgrounds with jungles and spider webs and all kinds of crazy things um, as photography advances, as, as the technique advances. Um, but these three things tell me that that's what era I have. The simplicity of um, the image on the cardboard backing the simplicity of the background behind her and the clothes that she's wearing. The tax stamp is just an added layer to that. So if you're lucky enough that you have one of these, they're, um, they're a great find at narrowing your search down considerably to a specific place at a specific time. So that process of active seeing that I was talking about, this is a technique that we were taught um, as part of a grant that I was working on for my library in um, 2012. And it's really served me very well um, in the decade plus sense, because what it helps me do is it helps me dig deeper into a photo and see details that I might have missed initially on just a cursory glance. So active seeing isn't just the, the process of viewing the photograph. It's also active speaking as well. And it's going to sound a little weird, but what you're doing is you're reciting out loud exactly what you see in the photo. And the reason why you do that is because when you say it out loud, you find additional details. If you're just looking and in your head, you're saying, oh, they're wearing a pocket watch or she's got pierced ears or they're wearing wedding rings. You're not going to commit it to memory. But if you say it out loud, it's going to help you remember it, but it's also going to help you find additional details you might not have noticed before. So you want to look at things like what type of print do you have? Again, is it a black and white? Is it a daguerreotype? Is it a, a color photograph? What's its condition? Is it in good shape? Are there tears? Does it have mildew or mold damage? You know, is the image intact or is part of the photo missing? Was it torn? Do you know? What type of uh, photograph is it? Is it a studio portrait or is it a candid? Um, what do you see in the background? So are there dogs in trees? Are there other people? Are there vehicles? Is it just a studio portrait with um, a, a curtain hanging behind them or um, maybe a, a specific type of backdrop? How many people do I see in the photograph? And be specific, not just I see a man and a woman and children, but I see a man and a woman and five children. Three of them are boys, two of them are girls. The boys look like they're older. The girls look like they're younger. Um, you know, the, the man looks like he's a senior citizen. The woman looks like she's in her mid 40s. And the reason why you go into that kind of detail is because it might spark something in your memory. I think I know who this family is. I remember mom telling me a story about her cousins. You know, there were, you know, five kids and the husband was older than the wife. And, you know, that might start to spark some kind of memory that you have that you can then use to help identify that photo as well as others. So when we look at photos, so when we look at this particular photo here, there's a lot of details that you could pull out of it that individually don't seem like much. We have uh, a brick sidewalk. We look like we're in a city. I see a bunch of storefronts. Um, I look at the truck and I see that it's for Johnson Oils. It's an oil company truck. But I'm also looking at the type of tires. This are, these are pneumatic tires before they moved um, to belt tires. So it's going to give me a date range. When were they using these types of tires? 
I'm looking at the names of the businesses and the street addresses on the buildings behind them. So I could see that Albert's store, the haberdashery, is at 715. The store next to it, Star Jewelers. You know, there's another store next to Star Jewelers that sells radio supplies. Um, next to it, it has what is either a photography studio or a calendar store. I look at what's in the window for Albert's store. And again, I see those straw boater hats. You're not going to sell those straw boater hats in the fall and winter. This is spring and they're getting ready for summer. So even though he's wearing a jacket with gloves and um, a hat, he's got a fedora hat on. I know that this is coming into spring and summer because they're starting to prepare to sell straw hats. So I'm looking for all of those details. Who do I know in my family that might have worked for an oil company? You know, who do I know in the 1920s that might have worked for Johnson Oils? And I'm looking for those details. I can go online and look in newspapers or city directories or other types of business directories for Albert's Hab store haberdashery for Star Jewelry store. I can look for these other businesses and try to be able to say, here's my my date range, Albert's store was in this location from 1919 to 1942. Okay, that's a very big window. How do I narrow it down? The tires are going to help me narrow it down because I know that I can look up online when they changed from pneumatic tires to belt tires and I can narrow it down even more. Or I could say, whoa, Star Jewelers was only in that location until 1926. So it's got to be sometime between 1919 and 1926. And you could slowly start to whittle down the window on this particular photo and potentially who it is as well. But by saying those things out loud, I start to notice details that I might not have noticed previously. So if you look in the very top corner, I've got a, a lighted sign. When did they start using lighted signs in that particular place? Or, you know, just in general, when did they start using lighted signs to advertise their businesses? So I'm looking for those kinds of details. So active seeing can be really, really helpful because it's going to help you pick out the details you might not have noticed. I never noticed dad is wearing a wedding ring in that photo. Obviously, this must have been taken after 1965. Or I didn't realize that grandpa started wearing glasses that young. And you're looking for those types of pieces of data. So we're going to talk just loosely. I'm not going to talk about every type of of photo, I'm just going to kind of give you some generalities to help you ballpark your images. The vast majority of us don't have daguerreotypes. We don't have glass plate negatives, but a lot of us do have tintypes in our collections. So these are very general dates. They're not specific dates, but in the United States, you'll typically find tintypes as early as 1855, and as late as 1885. But the vast majority of them in your collection are probably going to range from 1860 to 1880. Now, if you're dealing with photos from overseas, I have photos in my collection from family that were tintypes as early as 1848 in Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. So it just depends on where you are in the country as well and in what country you're in in doing your research because you're going to see film types um, appear on the East Coast a lot earlier than you're going to see them show up in the Midwest or the West Coast just because of how the United States has settled East to West. So that date range is loose, but a very good generality would be 1860 to 1880. Now, if I look at these photos, they're all individual. They are not from the same families. But what I do notice is that the two on the outside edges, the two men and the two women, while unrelated, are the exact same background. So what that's going to tell me is that these, was, these were most likely taken at the same photography studio. So these are both from families in Plainfield, Illinois, where I am, as well as the one in the center. But they're different families. One is the Lockwood family and the other is the Evans family. They are not related. But what it tells me is that they went to the same place to get their photos and that they were taken in the same era. The one in the center, what I know about this family, this is a photo that comes from the Lockwood family, is that this picture of Emma French, that she's blind. And I know that from family history. And once I say it, you see it. So it's those kinds of details. You could see that Emma's eyes don't track the same. She's not looking in the same direction. Her eyes are not focused on the same thing. So 
it's those types of details. If I don't have the luxury of having family to tell me um, that Emma is um, sight impaired, I wouldn't maybe necessarily know or think that maybe there was something different about this particular photo. Another thing in this photo is that if you can lean in and take a look at it, she's wearing a crepe dress because you could tell by how wrinkly the material looks and how it's mildly shiny. Crepe dresses are an indication of, of mourning that somebody had passed away in her family. So I know this is a Civil War era photograph because it's a tintype. I know that she's wearing a crepe dress just by looking at it. Who in the French family may have passed away in this time period that could help me identify when this particular photo was taken? So I'm, I'm pulling out those very subtle details. I'll talk more about fashion um, a little later on, um, but those types of clues could really help me narrow down. And what you look in this photo, if you look at the picture of Emma, you can almost see where the paper frame surrounded this image and wore away because with tin types they have sharp corners and the paper surround that they would put in that that would have the photographer's mark on it has fallen off at some time in history but i could see that it left its imprint from where it had been um, surrounding part of the image and you can see that circle um, that's embedded on the tin type itself If you have any of these diamonds in your collection, they have a very unique era. These are mid 1890s. Um, there's a couple of things in this photo to look for to help identify whether it's 1895, slightly before or slightly after. These prints were really, really popular, 1894, 95, 96, 97. Yes, it's a very short window. So if you, if you have one of these off kilter photos, you can immediately ballpark it to 1895. But a couple of things give this away. So fads, women have a tendency to get caught up in fads, whatever it happens to be. And two fads at the time were a hairstyle that was called a top knot. So if you look at the ladies in both of these photos, you could see their hair is twisted up and tied into a knot on the top of their heads. So top knots were very, very popular. With bangs, both of these ladies have really short bangs that have been curled under. With bangs would be pre-1895. Without bangs would be post-1895. And the fact that both women are re wearing really frilly collars, almost like Shakespearean collars up around their neck, that also tells me that these photos are probably taken between 1893 and 1895 based on the top knot, based on the diamond, and based on the collars that they're wearing. So you're looking for those little subtleties to kind of pull out, okay, is this 1895, 1896, 1897, or is this earlier? You're looking for those little details that are going to start to give it away. And diamonds alone puts you right at 1895. It's just whether you're going to be a year or two ahead of that or behind that. You're going to look for the details in the photo. You're going to look for the photographer's mark to see how long he was at that studio in those other kinds of identifiers. These long, narrow portraits, you know, they're three by eights. So they basically would be able to get four or five images on a standard sheet of paper and they would slice them into individual photos. If you're like me, you look at these photos and you instantly think those are senior, those are senior high school photos. And each and every one of these is exactly that. These really long, narrow, Photos that came in trifold, basically cardboard, construction paper. Um, and in two of these, I'm lucky enough that they embedded the high school um, emblem right into the photograph. So the one on the far left tells me it's JTS, which is Joliet Township High School. The one on the far right specifically says Plainfield High School. So if I want to know more, if I want to figure out who these students are, I know that this style of photography was really popular in the 19 teens. So I might reach out to the Joliet Historical Society or the Plainfield Library and say, do you have your books for these particular years? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them and I'm going to play a game of matching. I'm going to look until I can find these photos in the yearbook. And they might not be the same year. They might be different years. But at least I know I'm specifically looking at Joliet or I'm specifically looking at Plainfield. Now, the one in the middle, these are all done at Harrington Studio, but the one in the middle doesn't have a high school mark on it. 
So I might have to look at different schools to figure out what school it would be. But again, it's not a long window that I'm looking at. You know, we're only talking about a decade, maybe a little bit more at most that I'm going to go through to see if I can identify them. And the beauty is in the yearbook, it's going to tell me exactly who the student is. So then I'm going to definitely have a name to go along with the face. And there might be additional information about them in the yearbook as well. Or I can reach out to the school and ask for copies of school records or contact the Board of Education and ask if there's diplomas or any other additional information about those particular students. So, you know, these long, narrow portraits typically were used for high school graduations, for senior photos. You'll find them for other things, um, but it's a really good place to start. And if you're lucky enough that there's a high school labeled on it, it made your search even easier. Photo postcards. It seems like everybody has a photo postcard in their family at some point. If you are lucky enough that it was stamped and mailed, even better, because now I have a specific time that this image was taken. And I have two specific places. I have the person who's sending it and I have the person who's receiving it. So there's a lot of information that just comes from things that are sent through the mail. Um, but I'm also gonna use the fact that it's a picture postcard to date my photo as well. So these were incredibly popular in the aughts, 1905, six, seven, eight, nine. But you're going to see them at the turn of the century, as late as the 1920s. But if I were to pick a date to start and then go forwards and backwards, I'm going to start with 1910. I'm going to work backwards because they were really immensely popular, you know, 19, 1907, 8, 9. And then if I'm not finding an answer, I'm going to move forward into the teens. Not a lot of detail in either of these, but I'm blessed that the one on the bottom right had been mailed. So it's giving me the names of the three children who are in this photo. The one on the right or the one on the left was not, but I know that it was in a family co collection and that this is the photo photo of Lila Kanagi. Isn't Lila absolutely precious? But I'm going to pull out the details that I can read in the photo. So I can see she's sitting on a little metal chair. It almost looks like one of those soda fountain chairs with the twisted legs and the the, the circles in the back that look like hearts. I'm looking at the fact that she's wearing a simple white dress with black tights and black shoes, which is very indicative of the aughts. You'll see a lot of young ladies wearing very similar black tights and black shoes in that time period. Because it's Lila, I can look up what year is Lila born. So this photo, she looks like she's about two years old. So if Lila's born in 1906, and she looks like she's about two years old in this picture, then I'm probably looking at a photo taken around 1908. What else can I use to confirm that? And I'm going to look for additional details, maybe potentially other photos. I'm going to do a little research, maybe look in the newspaper and see if there's a birthday announcement saying that they celebrated her birthday by taking a photo. You'd be amazed at how many times photographs and photography studios are listed in your local newspaper. In a small enough community, everything seems to make itself into the paper. You probably have these in your collection as well. These are post-war Art Deco revival style enclosures. The, these are the ones with the, the cardboard stand on the back. So you could set them up on the piano or the fireplace mantle at home. There's a couple of things, again, that's going to give this away to an era. I'm looking at the fact that I have a soldier in uniform. And if you're familiar enough with the branches of service, you'll see that he has a Marine pin. He's got the eagle and the globe on his hat. So I know that I'm looking for somebody in my family who is a Marine. But on top of that, I'm looking at the three stripes on his uniform, which tells me that he's a sergeant. So what do I have in my family tree? Who do I have in my family tree? that was a sergeant in the Marines in either, this could be Second World War, this could be Korea. It's in that era, mid 1940s to mid 1950s. In this particular case, Elmer uh, or Eugene Carter had served in the Second World War. But I look at the photo of the young lady, again, very loose collared floral dress, very indicative of the mid to late 1940s, both in her hairstyle and in the floral prints that she's wearing. Anytime there's a type of military engagement that brings itself into fashion, both ladies' fashions and children's fashions. So sailor outfits, army style dress, um, star buttons, epaulets on clothing, 
tight pleats, you know, things that you would typically see in military uniforms, you'll start to see showing up in civilian clothing as well. I'm going to show you a photo of one right after the Civil War that's really indicative of that style in the 1870s. But we look at the the little boy here and see that he's in a sailor type romper. Um, so that, again, is telling me it's sometime between the Second World War and the Korean War. So you're pulling out those details. For her particular photo, it says that it was taken at, at um, France Studio. So I'm going to be looking that up to see where is that studio, when were they in business, and does it fit into this time period? Polaroids. So Polaroids had three distinct eras, actually four, if you consider the revival that Polaroids have had in the last five years. But when Polaroids first came out, they were on a very hard strata. They were on a very solid background. And you would have to take your film, put it in an envelope and mail it back directly to um, Kodak in order to get your film developed. So this is 1940s to 1960. In that second era of Polaroid cameras, you still had to mail it in, but instead of being on a really hard cardboard backing, they were on just more of a, not plain paper, but um, not quite a stiff construction paper on the background. So they were a little bit more pliable, a little bit more malleable. They could suffer damage and you wouldn't have image loss. What most of us think about Polaroids are those ones where you push the button and it develops the image all on your own. Those are the ones that you'll typically see from the mid 70s to the late 1980s. These are the ones that suffer the most image loss. So in this picture on the right, this is me, this is Easter 1979. You could start to see that fissures were starting to appear in the image itself because of the way that these were constructed. They're very malleable, they're bendable, they're also easily crackable. As soon as that image fissures and, and breaks, I'm going to lose that image just because of the materials and the, the quality of the materials that were made in that particular era. The codecs that you, the Polaroids you can get developed today, again, it still develops instantly, but it's more like the ink that you get from a home printer. You know, those, those color printers, photo printers that you can buy. They don't even use emulsion layer printers anymore. When you go to Walgreens or, or Walmart, they just print them out on these inkjet printers. Um, and that's the same kind of quality you're getting out of the modern day um, Kodaks and Fujifilm instant cameras. The one in the middle, this is my sister. This is 1971. Um, but it's it could sustain damage because it was on that hard backing. The image wasn't lost when the image was damaged. So the earlier... Kodak um, Polaroid images actually will hold up much longer than the, the ones we traditionally think of in the late 70s and early 80s. So if you have any of these from that era, from the 70s and 80s, definitely get them scanned before you have total image loss. But they're indicative of an era, and that helps you instantly identify when something is taken because of the strata, because of the material that it's made with. So let's talk about clothing styles. So these are both little boys. So when I look at this photo, I, in my head, instantly think, oh, little Lord Fauntleroy. So if you remember the, the story of little Lord Fauntleroy, turn of the century and um, turn of the 20th century, that style became all of the rage for dressing young children. Um, so while Walter on the right looks incredibly nonplussed, look at those coils. Look at the hair. Look at his hair. I mean, he's just he's adorable, but you could tell he's miserable. But if I see little boys in these very frilly wide collars, I'm instantly going to start with 1900 and then maybe work a couple of um, years in either direction. A couple of other things that helped me date these particular photographs. In the 1890s, there was a huge push for what was called the early, uh, the good roads movement. And I'm not going to go into the whole history of the Lincoln Highway or anything like that. But in the 1890s, bicycles were all the rage. And people wanted to have good roads so they could ride their bicycles. And not like today, not two-wheeled bicycles, but those great big three-wheeled tricycles where you're sitting six feet up in the air or eight feet up in the air. So tricycles like this photo I see on the left, um, this is Harry Gray. I know that this photo was taken before 1900 because it ties into that um, good roads movement. And this was a prop that every child wanted to be photographed with in that time period. A couple of other things that give the era of this away is that when you talk about potty training children, 
Boys would typically wear dresses, hand-me-down dresses or dresses specifically designed for boys up until the time that they were potty trained. So as soon as the child is potty trained, they would move to short pants, to, to knickerbocker pants, and they would wear short pants until they reached maturity, you know, which would be 12 or 13. You know, we're talking confirmation or, or bar mitzvah era, uh, and then they would move to long pants. So when I look at this photo, I know that Walter and Harry, who are both wearing short pants, have been potty trained at this point, and that they're probably somewhere between three, three and a half or four years old. So if I know the child, if I know the date of birth, I can also ballpark this era based on whether the child is still wearing um, dresses or whether they're wearing short pants. So that's going to help me also. And look at how elaborate the backgrounds are for both of these. Like I said, as you move into um, the um, 20th century, 1870s, 1880s, and 90s, you get very elaborate backgrounds um, in your photography studios. So let's talk a little bit more about fashion. The one on the left, you can see it's a group of children. If I were to look at this photo, I would say it's probably winter or really late fall because they're wearing hats and coats. But look at the young ladies' dresses and their hairstyles. They have very straight bobs. They haven't moved into pin curls or waves just yet, which would be the late 30s into the 1940s. They're still just straight bobs. They're wearing very, very simple house dresses. Again, indicative of the 1920s. Um, but I'm also looking at the little boys and I'm looking at the fact that they're wearing newsboy caps. So I'm going to look for the date range for when these particular styles of hats were, were popular for boys. And that's going to help me start to identify the time period. I cropped this so you could really get a good look at their clothing styles. But in the whole image, you could see the background where you could see the school and you can see who the two teachers are. So you might recognize the school in the background, which would help you say, oh, that's where great grandma or that's where mom went to school because you recognize the building, that could help you as well. Now, this image on the right, we're looking at, I look at this and I think Sherlock Holmes, you, know, you look at the fact that she has a, a very big bustle on the back of her dress. She has her hair in a very tight bun, but you see she has those curls again. I talked about those with the top knot, but you, you could see that she has, like her bangs cut super short and, and they're tightly curled. That was very, very popular in the early 1870s. So I'm looking at the style of chair. I'm looking at how elaborate the background is. We've moved out of the plain backgrounds of the 1860s into some pretty elaborate 1870s backgrounds. I'm looking at her two-piece dress that she's got the skirt with the big bustle in the back, the pleats in the front. Again, like I said, militaristic styles. They pulled in pleating and epaulets and things like that post-Civil War. I'm looking at her hair. I'm looking for details in the jewelry she's wearing. Does somebody in my family have that necklace? Or is she wearing a ring? Are her ears pierced? All of those are details that I'm going to pull out. So this photo, while I don't have an exact dress, is sometime between 1872 and 1875. And I'm basing that on what I know about fashion, what I know about that style of chair, and what I know about hairstyles in that era as well. So you're looking for all those little subtleties. This one on the left is, is, I love this photo. So these are two sisters and two really important details in these photos. The fact that they're both wearing hats that are just resting on the top of their heads. They're not on their brows. They're not down on their foreheads. They're just resting on the top of their heads. The 100th anniversary, the centennial of the War of 1812, between 1912 and 1914, you see a lot of those Napoleonic um, bicorn hats because 1812 to 1814, when Napoleon is overthrown and, and um, you know, deposed, that style of hat was really, really popular. It came back for the centennial. Over the course of the next several years, women's hats dropped an inch each year until by 1918, hats were resting right on the eyebrows. So I look at that hat and I know that this is the mid 19 teens because of how high their hats are sitting on their heads. But there's also another important detail in this. Both of them are wearing jackets with leather gloves in their hands with their mink stoles around their neck. 
Those aren't winter coats. Those are driving coats. These two ladies have an automobile and those are driving gloves and riding and driving coats. How do I know this? Believe it or not, there are lots and lots and lots of catalogs that are out there that you have available to you to help you identify photos. So in your handout, I give you the link to Internet Archive, which is a fantastic resource for catalogs, whether it's Marshall Fields, Montgomery Wards, Sears, or whether we're talking about things like Sears Kit Homes or automobile purchases. All of these types of catalogs are available to you. I'll talk about furniture for props and how you can look for catalogs to identify furniture pieces at the end. But I can go through and I can look at catalogs. I can do a Google search about ladies fashion in the 19 teens and look for more information. There's books available to you in your handout. I give you several books that Maureen Taylor has written about um, identifying bonnets and hats and clothing and hairstyles. Use those to your advantage. So this photo, I know that this is taken in either 1914 or 1915 based on their hat styles and the fact that they're wearing driving coats. Now, what I know about these two sisters is they were slave to fashion. So this was not going to be an out of season. This was not going to be, you know, a, a two year old coat that they were given from somebody else. Oh, no, no. They would have bought these coats because they were all the rage at the time. So I know that this is probably taken closer um, to 1914 than later than 1914. This photo on the on the right, you see that she's wearing a pin on her dress that is of a gentleman. And if you look closely at the dress material, you could see again, it's that kind of matte, shiny fabric that's a little bit wrinkly. She's wearing crepe. And that's probably a mort piece of jewelry for a fiance or a husband who might have died, who might have passed away. So she's wearing mourning clothes. I have the name of the photographer. Again, it's Pratt Studios in Aurora, not DC Pratt, just Pratt Studios in Aurora. So I can ballpark an era based on that. I'm looking for, again, she's got that really tight collar. So it tells me that it's probably right around 1900, maybe 1905. It's not frilly. So it's not 1890s. It's after that when they started to become a little less, um, a little less fancy. But I'm pulling those details out of the image. So speaking of morning customs and morning jewelry, here's a really, really good example. So we can see that the woman on the far right is wearing a crepe dress. It's very obvious based on the, the fabric, how the fabric looks. Look at her head. She has a top knot. This tells me that this photo is taken sometime around 1895. See how she has no bangs? And she doesn't have those curly bangs. So it tells me it's after 1895, not before. She's wearing a crepe dress. Again, she has the two older children have a picture of the baby pinned onto their jackets. Grandma is wearing black. You know, dad is wearing a dark colored suit. But then you have the two girls who are in white. In Eastern European cultures, it was very common to wear white instead of black for funerals. Um, I don't know specifically that this family is Eastern European because unfortunately it's an unidentified photo in our collection. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my family tree and I'm going to say, who lost a child sometime between 19, 1900 and 1895? Who lost a child and they had four older children? two boys and two girls. I'm going to pull those details out and I'm going to examine my tree to see if I could figure it out. More recent photos, these are all 20th century. If I look at the photo in the upper left-hand corner, I have a young lady who's holding a bouquet of flowers. She has a, a large bow in her hair and she's wearing all white. Some people would say, oh, this might be graduation or it might be um, confirmation. If it were confirmation or communion, there would probably be some be some kind of religious symbol, either a Bible, a rosary, candlestick, something else to denote a, re a religious service. She's holding just a bouquet of flowers. So yes, it could be she's a bridesmaid. It could be she's the bride. In this particular case, it's an eighth grade graduation. The fact that she's not holding a diploma isn't terribly surprising. Um, but one of the things that gives it away that she's not a bride is the fact that she's wearing a large bow in her hair. Young ladies would wear large bro bows when they were deemed Ms. As soon as they were old enough to be considered eligible to marry, they would lose the bow. So you'll notice a shift as you're looking at fashion from young ladies with bows in their hair to now I am of marriageable, uh, marriageable age 
you're not going to see bows anymore. Um, so that helps to identify is somebody considered a young girl who's not yet old enough to marry or is she old enough now and she's lost the bow. You see it in the children who are in this particular photo. A couple of the young girls have bows in their hair. Do I have four girls or do I, or five girls or do I have four girls and one boy? I have four girls and one boy. And the reason being is because the pleats and the very um, male cut and structure of that particular gown tells me that the child's not old enough to be potty trained, but the pleating and the belts, usually you'll see pleats and belts when you're when you're looking at photos of young boys, um, depending on the wealth of the family. But again, there's that chair, you know, that turn of the century chair that I can use to date my photo. Again, remember what I said about aughts about girls in just plain white dresses, ha house coats and black tights and black shoes. I'm going to ballpark this to the aughts based on the chair and based on the dresses that they're wearing. This photo in the center are my other grandparents. This is my grandpa Casey and my, my grandma Jean. If you look at the details, he's wearing a wedding ring, which tells me that this photo is taken after June of 1941 because they're already married. She's wearing gloves, so you can't see it, but he's wearing a wedding ring. He's holding a brownie camera and a cigarette. He's taking a picture of somebody else taking his photo, but it's not their wedding. She's not in a wedding gown, but it's somebody else's wedding because he's got a boutonniere in his um, buttonhole. So it's summer. You could see the trees are fully leafed out. You could tell that they're standing in a field with green grass, even though it's a black and white photo. She's wearing open-toed white shoes. So who do I know might have gotten married after June of 1941, where my grandpa Casey might have been a groomsman in that particular wedding. And it's going to help me start to narrow it down. This particular photo is for his, his brother, my Uncle Joe, and my Uncle Joe's second wedding to the same woman. Um, he had married my great aunt Catherine twice in 1939. And again, after he divorced her in 1943, married her again. Um, so I, I know that this is after that, by that one simple detail, and that's my grandpa's wedding ring. So you're looking for those subtleties. So let's talk about professions. So sometimes it's really obvious and it's really easy to tell what somebody's profession is. The young lady on the left is a nurse. And I can tell by the collar and the hat that she's wearing that this is what her profession is. But if you look really close at this photo, do you see she has a monocle? She has just one eyeglass that's resting on her nose in the chain that goes from her eye to her ear. That's a cool detail in this particular photo. It could be something like a train conductor. You might be able to read the name of the company on the train or the, the number of the train car across the conductor's hat, if you could zoom in in enough detail. You could have other types of businesses. We've got C.C. Heron's Home Baking and Baked Beans. Interesting combination there. But I have the name of his business. I have the street address where his business was. If you look at this photo, it's taken in winter because you could see snow in the left-hand corner on the street. But what makes this even more specific is this was probably taken either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And what gives it away is the garland hanging in the window. Because historically, you would not have taken, you know, you wouldn't have put your tree up in October like they do now. You would have put your, your tree up or decorated your business right at Christmas time. So this tells me that this is very close to Christmas Day, if not on Christmas Day. But do I have a little boy or a little girl? I have a little girl. See how flowing the dress is? See the black tights? That tells me that it's a husband and wife and a daughter, not a husband and wife and a son. Some of my other favorite professions, Art Nickel, who we saw in the, the Johnson Oils truck earlier when we were talking about active seeing, his last profession in life was as a bartender. And Art was too good at his job because he wound up dying of cirrhosis of the liver. But I can see him behind the bar. I could read what the labels of the liquor bottles are. I could see the details, the martini glass in front of him, you know, his work clothes, his white shirt and his apron. So it gives me a lot of details. Um, the one in the background, um, this was taken in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is a grocery store that was run by um, the Craig family. And I have Mr. Craig, Hollis Craig, off to the to the right, resting his hand on the, the counter. But just the detail in it, if you scan it at high enough resolution, you can see the names of the, the labels on the cans. I know that this is taken in 
um, fall or in early winter because I can see the beets and the radishes and the turnips in the bin. You wouldn't have beets and turnips most likely in the spring. So this is taken late in the year, just simply based on the fruits, the carrots that are in the rack waiting to be sold. So it's those little tiny details that make all the difference. If I could zoom in, I might be able to read the time and the clock on the wall um, in the background, or maybe there's a calendar on the wall that gives me a date in a month. <laughs> you hope that they didn't forget to change it, but you're looking for those kinds of subtleties. This is two pictures of Eddie Gardner. So Eddie Gardner was a race car driver in the 19 teens. Some cool things in this photo. Look at those pneumatic tires again. Look at how skinny they are like bicycle tires. Look at where the steering wheel is. It's on the passenger side. They're in their driving clothes. They've got their hats and their goggles. If you look at the gentleman standing behind him, they're also dressed in their, their driving coats and they're wearing gauntlet style gloves to, to drive their car. Eddie Gardner did not think that racing cars was fast enough for him, so he decided to become an aerial stunt pilot. So during the First World War, he trained U.S. Army pilots um, and then was a mail delivery for the, he was one of the first air mail delivery pilots for the U.S. Postal Service. Um, crashed, unfortunately, doing a stunt in Holdridge, Nebraska, and died in 1922. But here's him with his plane. And he took the time to identify the parts in the plane, where he put his mail, where the cockpit was, where his co-pilot sat. Look at the tires on the on the airplane, too. And the wood and the canvas in that plane that he was flying. Details like that can help you really date um, and identify eras in photographs. Again, it's almost like he's wearing a military uniform because he has like those uh, military style pants and boots with leg wrappings that you would have seen during the First World War. Speaking of First World War, military photos can give you a lot of details. So without knowing it, um, I would instantly date this photo to the First World War and for two reasons. The doughboy hat, which was very popular in the aughts and the teens, they phased that out after the First World War. So you could have somebody who chased Ponsrovia or was in the military before the First World War and wore one of these hats, but it would have been in that era. And trench coats. Trench coats came out of the First World War because they were designed to keep soldiers dry who were in the trenches. Trench coats did not exist before the First World War. So this instantly tells me that that's what this particular photo is. But you're going to be looking at other details um, in pictures. When I look at this one on the left-hand side, Civil War era photograph, again, incredibly simplistic background. I'm only getting an image of the soldier from the mid-chest up. I can see the details on his uniform. Again, no background, simple you know, image wall behind him, and the gold frame around the edge of the photo. So traditionally, you would have no frame for photos in the 1850s. Then you would have one single red line. Then it would evolve into two, two red lines, two narrow red lines, and eventually into gold lines. So during the Civil War, if you see red, double red line or gold lines, again, you're dating that to 1860 to 1865. So there's a couple of different details in this. The one on the right's a little bit harder, and I wouldn't expect you to, to recognize it, but this is actually Spanish-American War. And Andrew is a cadet. He's not officially in the military yet. He's still a cadet in school. He's got his sword. He's got his gloves. He has his official cadet uniform on. But you can look at the detailing in his hat to look for information or if there's anything else on his uniform that might be identifiable, a pin, a badge, a lapel button or something like that. So speaking of lapel buttons, I can look at this picture on the far right. There's a couple of details that give away what branch of service that John is in. So I see his wings. So I know he's in the Army Air Corps. I can look at the three stripes on his, on his arm and know that he's a sergeant in the Army Air Corps. I can look at the ribbon across his chest and know whether he's in the Pacific Theater or the Atlantic Theater based on the, the order of the stripes and the colors. Um, so in this particular case, I know he was in the Atlantic Theater. Um, and I'm going to look for those types of details. I'm going to look for the, the unit patch on his arm. You can't really see it in this particular photo, but it has a gold star with a dot in the middle of it. It's going to tell me what unit he was in. I'm going to look at the, the collar buttons that he has to see if it tells me any additional details about his service. 
the one on the left, this is actually the Korean War. And this was taken one of those four photo um, prints that it shoots out in a photography booth. And it was taken in Korea. And when it spit out the photos, all four of them were backwards, like a tintype. So, you know, their U.S. Navy hats appear backwards because of the technique of the, the film development that took place while they were overseas in Korea. Um, but these are Korean War naval uniforms that Jim and his buddy are wearing in this photo. This one's kind of a twofer. Elmer served in the First and the Second World War. Um, so I can look at the brim of his hat. Um, enlisted men's hats would have a different band across it than officer hats would. So I'm looking for the symbol and I'm looking for the banding on his hat to know whether or not he's enlisted or, or whether or not he's an officer. Elmer's an officer at this point. He's a first lieutenant. I'm looking at his um, ribbon. He's still in the U.S. He hasn't been sent overseas yet, so he only has one. He doesn't have a band yet to denote what theater he happens to be in. But on his on his collars, I can see the crossed flags. That tells me that he's in the Signal Corps. So I know that he's an officer of some kind. He's still stateside based on the ribbon, and he's in the Signal Corps. So if I didn't have any additional details about him, I could then go looking for additional records, either through the National Archives or through family members or local records to see if I could find additional details. While you can't see it in this First World War picture, he also has the Signal Corps emblem on his sleeve. It just looks like a silver disc in this particular image, um, but he has the Signal Corps. So he was in the Signal Corps in both the First World War and the Second World War. Okay, let's talk quickly about props and backgrounds. So like I said, as photography evolved, so did backgrounds and so did the use of props. As I said in early photography, late 1840s, 19, 1850s, early 1860s, incredibly simple backgrounds. I either have just a plain wall and they're standing on a carpet or they might hang, you know, a, a shag carpet or a, a animal skin in the background. That's it. There's no type of imaging going on behind them. That all changes starting in the 1870s and gets really elaborate right up to the turn of the century. So I'm going to be looking for the same background from photo to photo. I'm going to be looking for, if there's no photographer's mark, I'm going to be looking for those identifiable, identifiable features in the background. I'm going to be looking for those same chairs, those same tablecloths, those same props being used over and over and over again. Again, I look at this photo I've got, you know, the little boy in the short pants, so I know he's potty trained, but he's not old enough to um, be considered um, a teenager yet. So he's somewhere in that age range. I have a really fancy background, but he doesn't have the giant collar. So it's not going to be around 1900. It's probably going to be slightly before. Again, the chair that the little boy is leaning against in this photo, you might think, but that's a little girl. If your family is wealthy enough, yes. If your family is not wealthy enough, you're going to be passing down whatever it is you happen to have. He had an older sister, so therefore he gets his sister's dresses. Um, but I'm looking at the chair. I'm looking at the curve of the chair and the lion's heads. Why was that an important feature um, right around the turn of the century? You know, what might have been going on? You know, again, Egyptology was really, really popular after the turn of the century. So you get a lot of that in images. Looking at these two photos, same background and same chair. So we have this, you know, the same chair that, that both boys are sitting in in these particular photos. Again, little Lord Fauntleroy, look at that great big collar on the right-hand side. So it's probably about the same era. This one might be, again, the great big bow that the little boy is wearing on the left-hand side. I'm looking for those features. So these are probably taken at the same photography studio, roughly around 1900. I'm looking for those matches. Here's that ubiquitous chair. Oh my goodness, this chair is everywhere. And here's why everywhere. The photo in the top left is taken in Neighborville, Illinois in 1865. The chair on the center is taken in um, Aurora, Illinois in 1868. The chair with the, it's a little boy, um, in the top right corner is actually taken in Scotland in 1864. The chair in the bottom left is taken in Kankakee, Illinois in 18, roughly 1872. And the chair on this far side is taken in Iowa 
sometime around 1875. Different states, different countries, different families, same chair. The one in the bottom left, again, very militaristic in style. You know, she has epaulets, she has stars on her on her dress, pleading that you can't really quite see completely because I cropped this down. Very indicative of 1870 to 1872. Again, with the men's fashions, it's a little harder to tell. Um, you're looking for other identifiable features. See how plain the backgrounds are in the 1860s? Nothing going on in the background there. 1872-ish, very elaborate background. Same photography studio, same chair, same tablecloth. In the center, same chair, same tablecloth. In the upper right-hand corner, same tablecloth. In the bottom left-hand corner, same chair, same tablecloth. And in the bottom right corner, same chair. The tin types are all the same family. The carte de visite is a different, fam a different family, unrelated, same photography studio. The carte de visite has a photographer's mark. So that tells me who the studio is. They're all the same props. So you're looking for those same details from photo to photo to photo. You'll notice the cheeks of the tintypes are slightly touched up. So they have little rosy cheeks. The photo in the top right, her gown is colored in green. She's given color. I truly believe that she is given color because I believe she died shortly after this photo. Um, Agnes Craig in the upper photo had given birth to 11 children in 11 years. Only three of them survived to adulthood. I think this is the last photo that was taken of her and her children before she died. So the baby survives. There's no photo of the baby, but the two older children did. So let's talk about those marks. Sometimes you're lucky enough, it gives you a place in a specific address. Sometimes it'll just give you a generality, a block or a building. So this tells me, oh, it's Helena, Montana. There's not any more detail. Um, I.B. Stanton photographers, corner of Main and Market Streets in Amsterdam, New York, not terribly specific, but I can look through city directories. I can look through phone books. I can look through newspapers to see if I could find when that photographer was in business at that address. For some that were in business for decades, like D.C. Pratt, I can start with my tax stamp because I know that's between 1863 and 1865. And think of how photography evolves as, um, uh, or as um, marks and photographers' marks evolve as photography evolves. So we go from truly simplistic, just the photographer's address, to you know fancier backgrounds and illustrations. As we get around, I know oh that triangle. I know that diamond print is sometime around 1895. What do I notice? We went from being DC Pratt photography to Pratt's new photography gallery. Did DC Pratt die? Did he sell? Did he give it to his children? Did he sell the name to another photographer? We don't know, but I'm gonna go through city directories and newspapers to see if I can find a bill of sale, an announcement of a sale, or that DC Pratt died and that there's an obit. That's gonna give me more specific information. But I can take this address and see how long he was at 48 Broadway in Aurora and try to narrow down when these pictures were taken. So what am I gonna use for those school photos? I'm gonna go through school records and yearbooks if they're accessible. I'm gonna look for catalogs and advertising for the chairs, for um, photography studios. They had to buy their supplies from somewhere. So who's selling those backgrounds? Who's selling those chairs, that ubi the ubiquitous chair? You know, who's selling camera equipment? I'm looking for all of those types of things. I'm looking for city directories. I'm looking for newspapers. All of these are going to give me more information on the photographer, which in turn can give me more information about the people in the photos. Sometimes you get lucky with school records. So I had this photo. It was at the Wheatland Presbyterian Church. It's in their, their binders, their history binders. And on the back of this particular photo, it has the name of the teacher and five of the students are identified. So I only know the names of five out of 14 of these children. Well, I was lucky enough to know that the Wheatland Presbyterian Church school books still exist. The teacher's registers where she kept track of all of her students exist at the Little White School Museum in Oswego, Illinois, here where I live. So I went through the books looking for that particular teacher. And lo and behold, she only taught one semester, the spring semester of 1895. 
And when I look at this photo on the windowsill are lilac branches with lilac flowers. Well, in Illinois, lilacs only bloom in mid-May. So I know this photo had to have been taken in mid-May of 1895 because that's the only semester that that particular teacher happened to teach. So I went through the books and I was able to narrow down to within five days of exactly when all 14 students happened to be in school at the same time. So taking the photo, looking at the details, seeing the lilacs on the windowsill, getting the name of the teacher off of the back of the photo, and then utilizing that with other records, I was able to not only name all 14 children and identify them based on ages, because it gives me their ages in the school book, but also the date that the photo was taken as well. So you're just utilizing resources you already have or have ready access to, to help you start to identify the unidentified. Again, furniture catalogs, Sears Kid Home catalogs, clothing catalogs, hat you know, haberdasher or Milner catalogs can help me identify features. I can go through and see if I can identify that particular jardinier, identify that table or the chair or the clothing that the people are wearing to start to ballpark an era when that particular photo was taken, if I didn't know. I'm going to go through phone books and city directories. So I have a photo that's taken at Charles Murr Photography Studio. And in my photo, which I believe was taken in the 1870s, says that they were at 39 Jefferson Street. But the only city directory, the only county directory available to me in that era is 1873. So it's before what I believe the particular photo was taken. And in the city directory, it tells me that they're at 410 Jefferson, not 39 Jefferson. So a couple of things could happen. The city could have renamed or renumbered the streets. So 39 Jefferson could have become the new address or maybe was the old address. The photography studio could have moved for one reason or another. Um, the um, studio could have um, rented out another location because they were doing so well, their business was growing so well, so they opened up a satellite location. You won't know until you start investigating a little further. But for this particular photo studio, I was able to figure out exactly what happened. The entire building burnt to the ground in September of 1879. So I learned that, you know, the Murr Studio, which was huh, in on Jefferson Street, you know, was destroyed in a fire and he had to vacate and move to another location. So that tells me that this photo was probably taken after September 26, 1879, after the fire destroyed the photography studio. Where can I find city directories? Fold 3 has a really nice collection of city directories. I believe you have some available to you through Library of Virginia. I know there are some in Library of Congress's collection online for free. You have access to them through Internet Archive. You have access to them through Google Books and Hathi Trust. Family Search has some city directories available online. Each of the National Archives, um, regional branches, um, have access to a huge collection of city directories on microfilm. So there are lots of places where you could go to check the dates on your photography studios to see if you could figure out when they were in that location. Really good websites that you can use. Um, again, National Archives has a link about photography. Langdon Road is really, really good because she has a pretty extensive list of photography studios. If you do not see yours listed there, if you send her a message, she will add yours to her list and she will do a little bit of research about the dates that that particular studio was in business. So you can help both of you out if if you provide information to her. She'll help do a little bit of research for you. It's a fantastic site. Ford and Nagel is a good one also. Okay, before I go any further, I'm going to ask Paula and Donna, do we have 10 extra minutes? Can I keep going or do you want me to stop? Keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. Sorry, everybody, if you disagree. Um, age progressions and age regressions are a really important part of this, too. So when you're looking at photographs, if you're looking at a picture and you're like, you know, that really looks like mom. But I don't ever remember seeing a photo of her that young or, you know, that could be grandma, but you know, I don't remember her having that particular hairstyle. Age progressions can really be helpful. 
because there are certain features that never change. Yes, your ears, your nose, and your feet and your hands grow your entire life. Those will change. But the distance between your eyes, whether your earlobes are attached or detached, whether you have a cleft chin or not, or a scar, or you have um, um, it's under your eyes, those types of things never change. So you're looking for those identifiable features to do both age progressions and age regressions. So this is Elmer. He was the very first interview I did for the Veterans Oral History Project. He was one of my favorite humans. He has sadly passed. But this is a photo of him from the day of our interview. He's wearing a purple heart tie. If I didn't know him, then I would know that I was going to go look to find out how he was wounded because only people who were wounded were awarded the purple hearts. So I'm looking for information in his military record. But then he brought a picture of himself in his naval uniform. He was in the Navy. And I can tell by the symbols on his sleeve what um, what his job was. He was actually on a destroyer and his job was to load the torpedoes um, into the, you know, into the torpedo guns um, on a destroyer. His ship actually took kamikaze um, crashes twice, which is how he was awarded the Purple Heart. He was injured twice, not severely, but injured um, in both circumstances. Um, but if I look at Elmer, how his smile, the mischievousness in his eyes, how one eyebrow raises when he half smiles, how, you know, he just has like that one right eyebrow that goes up a little when he smiles. His earlobes are still attached. They might get bigger, but they're never going to suddenly detach. The shape of his jaw, the lines by his mouth, all of those are details that I can use to start to identify and find people as they age or going backwards as they get younger. This is Janet. She was four foot six if she was an inch. She was a very, very tiny woman, but she really, really liked really tight buns all throughout her whole life, her entire life. She always had her hair pulled back in a tight bun. So the shape of her eyebrows, the narrowness of her nose, the she had a very broad, solid chin. I can find Janet in different photos from time to time just based on those features that I know about her. Very small, dainty hands. The photo in the center is her and her children. The photo on the far right is her and her grandson. And it's startling how much her grandson looks like her son. So if you're looking at a photo and you're like, wow, that looks just like Uncle Bob, it might be Uncle Bob, or it's going to be somebody probably in Uncle Bob's family. So who do you know who looks just like that person and put it in that family group? So here are her siblings. I showed you the picture of Alex a little earlier. Um, in his dress, his older sister's dress. But we have Alex and mom. We have Alex. We have Alex and older sister, Marion. Marion had the most piercing eyes that I can spot her in photos because she always looks like she's squinting, like she could bore a hole right through you with how intensely she's looking. So I can spot Marion from photo to photo and photo based on how narrow her eyes are. As Marion aged, but in the very last photo, she's blind by this point, but again, still has that very piercing look about her face. But I can follow her eye structure, her ears, how her ears tilt out a little, how Alex's ears tilt out a little. I can spot a Craig in a photo left and right just because they all look like taxis with the car door open. They all have very identifiable ears. Um, but Alex always had crazy hair. Like you could see it in a baby. You can't really see it. Be well, maybe you can on your screen. You don't have the chat box in front of you. Um, but he always had one little piece of hair that just kind of in a different direction. I have a picture of him as an 80-year-old man. Still has that one hair that's just haywire sticking out in a completely different direction. I know that that's Alex. I talked a little bit about um, Elmer Craig and about his best friend, Clinton um, King. He, Clinton King was the center photo of the high school photos. I can look at this class photo. This is from 1908. Look at how many kids don't have shoes on. Um, again, the girls in the simple dresses and the black tights. I know I'm dealing with a photo in the aughts. The big bows telling me that they're not yet old enough to be married. <coughs> but I'm looking at Janet, looking at Elmer, and I'm looking at Clinton. Janet had that same smirk until she died at 99 years old. 
I can spot Janet in photos based on the smirk that she has on her face and the fact that she has bags under her eyes. Her and her siblings are all very easy to identify because they all have the, the same eye style. Clinton is in the middle. Again, ears are sticking out. Very stern looking face. You know, very straight eyebrows right across. You know, his ears kind of stick out. You can see his earlobes are detached. I'm looking for that. And then Elmer, once again, he has what I like to call a little carrot, where one part of his eyebrow kind of raises up in the middle and creates like the, the carrot symbol on a keyboard. You know, that little up arrow. I can spot Elmer from picture to picture because of that. Again, the lines around Elmer's face as a young man are just deeper ingrained as an older man, but I can still easily identify him in pictures because of those features. Now, what if I wanted to go backwards? Same thing. You know, this picture, these are Ellie Burnett. This is her right after giving birth to her first child. This is her wedding day when she married Reverend Thomas Burnett and her as a young lady right before she got married. She really likes those really tight parts. In every one of these photos, her hair is pulled super tight in the middle, perfectly straight line, likes to curl it along the edges. Those nice frilly collars that I talked about, those Shakespearean era collars. I came across a photo album that I believe was about 15 years earlier that somebody had put online as an unidentified photo album. As I started flipping through these 64 pages, I was like, wait a second. I know this family. And there were at least 30 different photos that I could attribute to photos I had of this family only 15 years later. So I reached out to the owner of the album and I said, okay, I believe this is my family. I'd love to buy the album from you. And they said, well, what's your proof? So I sent them photo after photo after photo. And finally he came back. He said, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is the same family, but oh, I'm sorry. I've already sold the album. Oh, I was so close. But at least he gave me scans of all of the images that he had. But I had these photos of Allie to start, which is why when I started going through these albums, I was like, wait, I know that hairstyle. I believe this is a picture of Allie 15 years earlier. She's a young lady, probably about 14 years old. Again, likes to have the high collar around her neck, really tight part down the middle and curls. And you think that could be anybody. What's your proof? What else do you got? So I kept going. I had these pictures of her parents already. And yes, I reversed this one because another photo I had of him was a tintype. And tintypes are actually reversed. You need to go in and mirror them so that you have the correct reflection. Um, so I had done this for that particular photo. But I had these photos of mom and dad already. In that same album, I had these photos. So the woman, again, likes the bows, likes to wear bow collars, very, you know, hair pulled back you know, loosely into a bun, same thing, only 15 years younger, kept going. These are Thomas Burnett's parents. This is his mom, Elizabeth. This is his dad, Dick James. Again, very stern, very simple, nothing fancy. See how his hair kind of sticks up a little bit in a different direction and his under chin beard that he has going there. So stern his eyes are. Look at his earlobes. I have no doubt in my mind that that is a picture of his father 15 years earlier and his mother. His mother had very long, narrow fingers, and you can see that in this photo. All of these photos were taken in and around Albany, New York, which is exactly, or not Albany, were in and around Amsterdam, New York, which is exactly where I know the family was at the start of the Civil War. So again, I reached out to Tom from Fulton History and we talked it through and even he thought, yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think they're the same family. So sometimes you could just take that info, you know, from adults and work them backwards to start to identify younger family as well. And like I said, if you truly believe that you're dealing with somebody who looks just like Aunt Margaret or who looks just like Uncle Bob, run with that gut. So I am the only one in my family that has dimples like my grandpa Casey. Nobody else in my family has dimples. I'm the only one. So I know that I get that trait from him. The two photos in the center, Eureka is the one on the bottom and the diamond. I know that's 1895. I believe the photo above is her mother. She looks exactly like her mother in so many ways. And I believe this photo of her mother was taken right about 1878, 1879 when her parents got married. The photo on the right is Marion. I talked a little bit about Marion and her piercing eyes. Marion had a granddaughter, Marion. The first time I met Marion, I actually gasped because she looked so much like her grandmother. It actually took me aback. And Marion said, oh, I get that a lot. 
you know, and absolutely, she looks exactly like her grandmother. So if you have that gut reaction as you're sorting through photos and, and you think it looks like somebody in the family, put it in that family pile, because at least it's a starting place to help you start to family group and identify who these unidentified family members are. So I already give you in your handout the websites. You can go and look at these at any time when you feel comfortable. Retronaut and Shorpy are great for general photos. So if I want to know more about 1920s bathing suits or I want to know more about 1850s era bonnets, I can search these sites for those types of things or 1890s bicycles, right, to try to narrow down. I can go through these photo archive sites and look for that. Library of Congress, another fantastic resource. Here in Illinois, we have the Illinois Digital Archives. You guys have access to Virginia Memory, so absolutely take advantage of what Virginia Memory has to offer. Like I said, books are fantastic. I had already mentioned Maureen Taylor's books. She has some really good books available to you. They're already listed in your handout. All of these would be a good resource for you to start to help identify and age and date photos. I showed you the picture of Marion and her brother Alex earlier. This particular photo says DC Pratt, negatives preserved. I believe this photo was taken in Scotland and this is a copy that DC Pratt made. And the reason I believe that is because Marion and Alex were born in 1860 and 1862. They did not come to America until November of 1866 and they did not arrive in Aurora until August of 1867. There is no way that Alex would be five years old in this photo and still wearing a dress. So I believe that this is a copy of a photo that was made here for when their eldest daughter got married in 1868, because this photo was in the album that was given to Agnes as a wedding gift that passed down through the family until I met her granddaughter in 2010. Now, Agnes is the one that had 11 children and only three survived. Her youngest son, William, who's the one that she's pregnant with in that last photo, his daughter was 93 years old and was still alive when I met her, and she had this album. So I believe that this is a copy of a photo. But again, taking everything that you know about the family and putting it together to say, that's not possible. That's not possible that Marion would be seven and Alex would be five in this photo. They look like they're about four and two in this particular photo. So working that magic in your head and making those numbers work. So I'm going to turn my camera back up. I am perfectly happy to answer questions. If you don't want to have to stay on because I talked forever and I apologize for that. Um, you can easily send me an email. You have access to my email address in the handout. Um, otherwise, I'm perfectly happy to stick around as long as you want me to talk photos. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're getting lots and lots of thank yous in the chat box. Okay. Um, and of course, there were questions there. So I'm not going to read every, every one of the comments, but I'm going to at least to try to address the questions. Um, you covered photo photographers and marks and addresses after this question was asked, but I'll still ask it. Um, if you have the photographer's name and city, is there a chance to follow up with that business 100 years later? Potentially. So because photographs, because photography studios are private entities, they can be bought and sold as often as they'd like. There's nothing that requires them if they go out of business to turn their negatives or turn their records over to anybody. But in a lot of instances, sometimes they do. So in Plainfield, where I work, they didn't. So we have no record other than the photographer's stamps on the back of photographs and what we know about the people in the families. But for some larger institutions, sometimes they do. So like the Chicago History Museum in Chicago has several photography collections that were donated to them when businesses went out of business. Um, so there's always the chance you can reach out to the local historical society or the library or the history museum in that community and ask if any records were donated. But we're probably talking less than a 50-50 chance, but it still is, doesn't mean that it's not worth the effort to do it. Or if the studio is still in business and it's been passed down through the generations, do you still have records? You know, did your family keep log books by decade or by year of who they sold prints to? Or do you still have the original prints? It doesn't hurt to ask. 
Yeah, someone followed up but, but on that with, I had an ancestors class reunion photo. I traced the photography studio and actually made contact with the photographer's son. While he does not do photography himself, he does still have his father's now deceased collection of trays of photographs. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. That's I'm amazing. so glad you, you, you know, stayed, you know, like a bloodhound stayed on that trail until you got an answer. That is one. That's why yeah, sometimes, the, the sometimes the genealogy of the, of, a, of the photographers might help. <laughs> exactly. And that's why DC Pratt is such an interesting example is because he was in bus business for over 40 years. Pratt's new photography studio was him selling out to Giles studio Giles studio was already at the corner of Benton street. They just absorbed the Pratt name because it was so, so well known. So Giles became, you know, new Pratt's studio because he wanted to keep the business, even though it was sold out. And I found that in the city directory and a newspaper article. Sorry, I was posting the handout, so I got lost track a little bit. Um, about the diamond photos, wonderful. I have a couple of those, and that helps me answer a question. Um, let's see. Okay. Do they do they have the top knots? I want to know if the women have the top knots. It seems like they go hand in hand. Probably. Aren't those ugly? Like those top knots were terrible. And they, they and they probably hurt if they're <laughs> if they're pulled really tight. It but they probably hurt. All twisted and yeah, that's not a fad I want to see brought back. No. <laughs> Um, many, most of my older photos are glued onto black pages and albums. I would love to be able to remove them to see if anything is written on the reverse side. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And the reason being is because you have to think of the era that the album was created. So like my grandpa created a scrapbook during the second world war and he used rubber cement. I'm going to do more damage trying to get it off of that page than if I were to just leave it the way it is. Um, Sadly, it sounds like they didn't use for photo corners, which would have been a blessing, right? Because you could just pop one edge out and check, check the back of it. What I would probably do is I would scan or photograph the entire album. I would not take it apart, but I would probably look for the weak links. So if I have a page that's already torn or if I have an image that's already coming loose, I might take um, like, because you could buy an archival knife or a sharp knife and, and kind of like try to get it loose to take a look at the back, but I wouldn't try to do it for all of the photos. About the ladies in the driving coats, the consensus uh, from the comments is that uh, the, the stoles were fox. Um, okay. There was a name mink, for those. Yeah, fox. Yeah, there was a name for those fur pieces that sat on the coat. Some were fox pieces whose mouth clutched another piece of the fox. Can't recall their name. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. Uh, as, what was the name of the grocery store in Lincoln, Nebraska? The person who's asking is from Lincoln. Oh, um, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I would have assumed Craig because Hollis Craig was the one that ran it, but I don't know. That's a really good question. I'd have to go back through my family tree and take a look. But they were in they were in Nebraska for some of them are still in the Lincoln, Nebraska area. Um Hollis's dad, Henry Craig, was um, the jailer, the town jailer in Lincoln for like three decades. They even gave him to key, the key to the jail when he retired. And it was like this big honking key that they gave him that he would lock the door, the front door with. Um, but they were there a long time. The photo of the two Korean War Navy sailors whose hats were backwards because it was in a photo booth. I noticed it was also colorized a little bit. Um, was that also part of that technology or do you think it was done after the fact? Don't think it was done after the fact. Just in my conversation with Jim Smith, who was the, the young man on the left in the photo, um, it sounded like that's the way it came out. He just slapped it in an envelope and mailed it home to mom. Like okay. he didn't even separate the four photos. Like it's still the four photos. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's the way it came. So I'm wondering if can if types of colorization can maybe help date or identify photos as well. Potentially but too, because you'll see a lot more of that starting in the early 1940s, where it'll be subtle tints that were done. You know, it might be the hat, like, like was the woman in the gold the cheeks, yeah, the green the green dress that that came up a little bit later, yeah. And then there's my heritage and ancestry, where you can just click a button <laughs> or Photoshop. Yeah. Or my only concern with my heritage is my heritage is that. If you read 
and they might have changed it. But if you read the details on colorization, it says that they get to kind of keep a copy of that photo when you upload it to the service. And I don't want anybody but me having copies. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't uploaded my photo, but um, so, it's fo- like so Photoshop Facebook. it is for you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like or Facebook. So, if you post something like on that. Facebook, yeah, they have the right to retain a copy of it. So. Okay. Um, I have a questionable connection between possible relatives. Can earlobes change if the person was in a severe vehicular accident? Unless there was something that, you know, that they, you know, that you specifically know that they suffered some type of damage, but typically it wouldn't happen to both. So like if you're in a crash and the right side of your face is injured by glass or, you know, that might be, but you're looking for other features too. Or so, like burned in a fire or something like that. Exactly. I so odds are they both wouldn't be. Um, so you're looking for things like, you know, the shape of the eye, the distance of the eye, you know, how far the ears come down versus like where your mouth and your chin is. You're looking at the shape of the chin, the, the, the shape of the jaw. So you're looking at other types of identifiable features in the face besides just the earlobes. But I would think that it would be unlikely that both would be damaged, that you might still be able to use. And it's hard with photos because sometimes you're looking straight on and you could see one, not the other. Um, or sometimes your your head is turned more, so your face might look wider than it normally would be. We're not all flattering in every photo we take. <laughs> um, but I would look for some of those other features too, like pierced ears. You know, if you have pierced ears, you're not, not going to have pierced ears. My dad lost a $20 bet to my mother because he was convinced that a photo was me and not my sister. And when I came home, he's like, well, who is this? This is you. And I was like, no, that's not me. That's Nicole. And, he, and my mom was just like... <laughs> I'll take that $20 now because I told you it wasn't her because I had pierced ears and she didn't. Ah. Any thoughts on approach for photo analysis in foreign countries? You're going to follow the same types of things. You're going to look for photographer's marks. You're going to look for um, fashion fads. You're going to look for those same types of things with photographer's marks and backgrounds and, and props. It's the same type of thing, regardless of where you are. You're still going to be looking for familiar, fa- you know, familial features. You're still going to be looking for things like wedding rings and pieces of jewelry that you might be able to identify. You know, so you're still doing the same techniques, whether you're looking in France or Germany or whether you're looking in Australia or Canada. It's the same types of processes. Um, getting lots of comments on your red princess phone. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, was it true my, that kid? My it's... communist phone, my my red phone to call the Kremlin. <laughs> yeah, was it true that kids in the 1800s had rules for the part in the hair, girls down the middle? Based on different eras, yes, there would be def you know definitely specific styles that would have been more common. Um, I can't say everybody followed the rule all the time, but it helps. It definitely helps to to narrow down to particular time periods in particular places because not everybody had the same styles in every place, right? Because it wouldn't have necessarily you wouldn't have had the the high fashion and the the rigid class structure of style on you know, in the Midwest or out West that you would have on the East coast. So things might be a little looser and they might be later to arrive. You might not get that top knot till later, till 1895 instead of 1893, the further West you go. It takes a while to get there. Thanks so much. This was great. I saw a photo of my great grandmother that might have been from the 1870s. She had short curly bangs and hair pinned up. Someone found the photo in Oregon and a newspaper article described it, but she had lived in New York and Wisconsin. So photos can travel. (laughs) And not only that, but the Associated Press is not a 20th century phenomenon. The Associated Press dates back to the 1850s. So on a truly slow news day, you'll find all kinds of things picked up by the AP. You know, so I mean, it, it, You'll find things mentioned in newspapers across the country. Don't discount something because you think the family didn't live there. If it got picked up by the AP, it could show up in Michigan. It could show up in California. It could show up anywhere. Indeed. I saw one of the small Coca-Cola chairs like those that with the children that belonged to my mother. She was born in 1909 and had it her entire life. Yeah, and it might have been something that was given to the family before she was born. 
the alas, the oldest albums in my family were in my sister's basement when it flooded. She removed the photos and they all curled and lost context. Mm -hmm. But you can take the curl out of photographs. I mean, it's a little more difficult. It's about introducing enough humidity to get the the paper to relax again. I think um, Denise Lib Levinick has a has a blog post about that. Yeah, Is Library it, of Congress has a, a a really good article about how to fix that. And the Image Permanence Institute, I think, has info on it as well. Cool. What time frame was sepia used in photos? You're typically well, sepia sometimes is just fading. Um, but I would probably say I see it most in the teens and the 20s, but you'll definitely see it in earlier cartes de visites as well. It just depends. Let's see. What resolution do you scan at to get such level of enlarged details? It depends on what I'm doing. So if it's a studio portrait and there's not a lot of detail to the background, I'll scan at 300 DPI. But if it's something like a class photo or a family reunion where there's a lot of people in it, I've scanned things as high as 1200 DPI. It depends on what you want to use it for because the higher the, the DPI that you scan, the larger the file. So if you scan something at, 18, at 800 or 1200 DPI, you're going to have a 100 megabyte file. It's going to be huge. And it doesn't always necessarily blow up and keep the crispness of the detail. So sometimes you'll still blow it up at 800 DPI and it'll still be grainy. Um, but if I'm trying to look for details like pierced ears, eyeglasses, wedding rings, jewelry pieces, I'll scan at 800 or higher. Um, I, I'll add, obviously, I've got a photo scanning issue as well. If you could look at my, my virtual background. Um, some I've had some of those old photos that were like really, really tiny, like like smaller than the wallet size photos you get from schools. And sometimes I will blow those. I, mean, I, I will scan those. They're not going to be as large. Uh, because it was a small workspace to begin with, but it sometimes helps to at least see some of the de the details, like you said. And you're at the mercy of the technique that they use. Some exactly. are just naturally somewhat blurry, and yeah. they're not going to improve. Even if you use, you know, something that improves crispness, you know, it's still not going to make it tight enough to really see detail. And of course, the the question that always comes up when we speak when we talk about scanning, uh, TIFF or JPEG. Oh, TIFF, absolutely. Because a TIFF is an archival file. So my my master's degree is in archives and preservation. That's what I went to school for. Um, so that's, you know, I love to talk details of archiving. Um, but JPEGs are compressible files. So every time you rename it, every time you cut and paste it, you're losing little bits of that image. It's like taking a piece out of a puzzle until eventually the image is lost. Whereas a TIFF file, you can rename it, you can cut and paste it, you could share it, you can open and close it a million times. You're never going to have any image loss because it's non-compressed. But with JPEGs, eventually the image will, will fail the more times you mess with it. And you get a better quality. You can always make copies. You can always convert TIFFs to JPEGs and use those to post on social media, to share with family, you know, to, to you know, publish even as long as it's at 300 DPI. But the TIFF file is your master. It's like you wouldn't want to take the birth certificate and pass it all over town. You're going to make a copy of it. You're going to keep the original birth certificate intact. You're going to copy it and pass the copy around to preserve the original. The TIFF image is, is the same thing. You're, you're preserving the original. Indeed. Well, that is it. I will say thank you very, very much. You're, it was well received, uh, judging by the chat box. You have great so ideas. All of you were on today. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It, it's it's dwindled a little bit in the past few minutes, but for the most part. Uh, one more scanning question: What kind of scanner and software do you use? Um, right now across from me, I have an an Epson V six hundred, which I absolutely love for small household projects. It won't do really anything bigger than um eight and a half by 11. On my desk at work at my library, I've got an Epson XL 1000, which is one of the big flatbed scanners that'll do up to 12 by 18. That scanner we purchased as part of a grant in 2009, and that baby is still going strong. And knock <laughs> on wood that every day she still turns on and keeps chugging away. Um, both of them run on Twain software, you know, where I can do, you know, photo corrections and, and, you know, decluttering my image and dust elimination and stuff like that. I really, really like Epson products. I've never had any problems with them. And software? Um, it comes with it, but I use a Twain software, just like Mark Twain, T-W-A-I-N. Um, 
that I use because it's the software that um, the state of Illinois uses. So when I upload things to our, our grant projects, it's I use their software. Makes sense. All right. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Tita, for all the great information. And this uh, recording will be up probably sometime tomorrow. So I will share the link on, on social media, and you'll get it in your next Griva email as well. And we'll put it on the website sometime tomorrow, too. Thank you so much, everybody. Happy holidays. Again, thank you have you. my email. If you have any questions, let me know. Sounds great. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.